It's 7.30 Friday morning, 24th of November, getting closer and closer to, <laughs> I won't mention that, 24th, oh yeah, 25th next month, not long to go. Right, 4 degrees centigrade, no it's not, that's yesterday. 9 degrees centigrade, 48 Fahrenheit, 68% humidity. My son called me from North Carolina and he said, I've got this humidity thing all wrong because you know I've been saying 98% humidity. Why aren't we all drowning if 98% of the air is water? <laughs> he explained it to me, which I don't understand. Well, I do, but I forget. 1021 millibars on the barometer. Yes, it's not that the air is 98% water that you're breathing, you know what I mean? And he mentioned dew point as well. I, I do know all about that, or I did many years ago, but I've forgotten. Now, practical jokes. <laughs> Let's start off on a, a, a funny note, shall we? This made me chuckle. Not so much, this is from Ian in Scotland. Hello, Ian. Made me chuckle not so much because of the, the content, but the way Ian is telling it. This lovely schoolboy humour and his sniggering and chuckling is absolutely, I, I just love it. See what you think and then we'll, <laughs> then we'll get on with the podcast. Hello, Ray. A couple of thoughts on your uh, topic about the uh, practical joker, or practical jokes. About five years ago when my late mum was still alive, she'd uh, cleaned out the underneath the kitchen sink and uh, cleaned it out and cleaned uh, the pipes, uh, the waste pipe, because she said there was a persistent smell. She wasn't sure if it was coming from the sink or the connected washing machine. Not to end up, I hasten to add. And she says, oh, uh, uh, she bleached it and everything else. So she got rid of the smell. And uh, I was doing the dishes, uh, washing the dishes for her. I says to my mum, I says, mum, that smells back. So she, she came back in. <laughs> she said, oh, that's ran <laughs> rancid. What is that? And then she clicked. She says, that was you. That was disgusting. I dare. <laughs> I broke wind. <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> got my mum to think it was uh, the, the drain again. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, I used to go visit my mum sometimes. And uh, where she lives, it's not too far from the countryside. And, you know... Uh, as farmers do, the muck spread. And every time I come in, she says, oh, we knew you were coming. We could smell you before we seen you. <laughs> Another time, I was working in a place, I'll not say where or what position, but I was basically doing night shift. And there was another night shift worker in a different place, kind of away from me, but I, could, I, could, I, knew, I knew this person was on duty. And we had a kind of speakerphone system I had a, uh, a speakerphone, so I call the number and I would hear it ringing, and then he would uh, he would lift the phone, and I would pick up the handset, and it'd still be on speakerphone, and I I, I put um, I put the handset uh, backwards and forwards from the speaker, and uh, you know it howled back and forward. <laughs> and then I did that for a few seconds and put the phone down. It was really quite funny. Um, there was, uh, they were using a radio system as well, and every time they went on the radio to do something, uh, not not all the time, but I would, uh, I would, I, I would ring the phone so you could hear the, you could hear on the radio transmission, you could hear the phone ringing, <laughs> and I put it, I put it down as soon as he answered. I don't know, Ian. That chuckling, that schoolboy sniggering, it takes me back to my school days. It just made me laugh. I played it to Trish. She was sniggering as well. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Thank you for that. Anyone else got any MP3s, little audio recordings or whatever? Be great to hear from you, and I'll put them on uh, one of the episodes. Just going back to the weather, I didn't tell about the wind. There's no leaves on the cherry tree, as I said. Slight breeze from the west. It's meant to be a nice day today. My weather forecast on the iPad says rain, and on the telly they say sun, so you just don't know where you are. And going back also to the, the dew point and all that stuff, many years ago, I got quite into the weather forecast thing and I made myself a Stevenson screen. 
You know what that is, don't you? I won't explain it because you can look it up. In there, I had my thermometer, the dew point thing, and uh, what was it? Uh, pressure. And I had out outside the screen in the garden, I had my rain gauge. I got quite into it, actually. It's interesting, the weather forecast. Anyway, enough of that. Let's move on. Bob, nice to hear from you. Sent me pictures of uh, adverts and things of Marley tiles. I mentioned those, didn't I? Because uh, we had, in the old days, not fitted carpets, but carpets that ended... I don't know why they did that. Ended about a foot, 18 inches away from the wall. And then you had either floorboards, which were painted brown, or what they used to call Marley tiles. They were in most uh, new-build houses. I don't like that term. Do you like that term, new-build? I don't know. Why not new houses? Why is it new build? Anyway, thanks for that, Bob. Quite interesting. And uh, in a pub, an uh, advert of a, a pub with Marley tiles on the floor. I prefer the old spit and sawdust. Or so. <laughs> there was a pub near to us up to, what, two or three years ago, and that had just floorboards. I mean, it wasn't spit and sawdust, but it was floorboards, and it was a really old... A genuine old British pub. I really liked it. It's now all been turned into flats. So that's another pub gone. They're disappearing. They are. Left, right and centre pubs. They're just disappearing. How many a week did they say on the telly? A little while ago, a couple of months back, they were talking about pubs. Oh, there are so many a week just closing down. I don't know what's happening. It's such a shame. I remember in the 50s and 60s, most pubs, a lot of them, had an off licence so they could sell booze to take away if you like and uh, I remember going round our local off license joined on to the pub what was it the golden was it the golden lion or the I can't remember what it was now or the red lion something like that and I used to go around there <laughs> to the little off license bit in the evenings because the shops were closed and I could buy a bottle of Tizer that was rather nice knit round to the the pub offy as we called it the offy and buy a bottle of Tizer and when I was a bit older like 14 go around there and buy a, a bottle of pale ale or something. <laughs> 14 years old, honestly. They didn't care back then. I mean, it's you know, we weren't alcoholics. We were, I suppose we looked older than 14, I don't know. And you could buy cigarettes in there. So you go around the pub off licence. It was a separate door to the pub, normally. There's one big pub near us, the George, it's called, the George. I remember they had a door at the front, which was the off licence, uh, just to the side of the main door. You go in there and there's all the drinks and there's a little counter and you could see through to the bar, the main bar of the pub, but you're in the shop part. And uh, I used to pop in there a lot in the evening, get some cigarettes, get a, a bottle of whatever. <laughs> but that's all gone. Are there any off licences around these days? I think there are one or two. Basically, it's supermarkets, isn't it? That's the trouble. When supermarkets first turned up, I remember people saying, oh, this is so good, get all your stuff in one place. But of course, what they didn't realise was that while they're in the supermarket, all the little shopkeepers, the off-licence and all the others, the, the grocer, the butcher, the candlestick maker, they're all closing down. And of course, now people are saying, oh, the shops are closed in the high street. Well, it's your fault. <laughs> you, you didn't go there. So they closed. All this stuff about progress, I don't know, is it progress? It just seems just seems that we're going backwards to me in many ways. Shops disappearing. I'm going to read out some of your practical joke emails later because uh, that's what this episode, well, it's not what it's all about, is it? It's a hook to hang it on, as my friend used to say. I had an editor friend and he'd say it's a hook to hang it on if it's a story or a, a book, you know, whatever, work of fiction. You need something to sort of hang it on. And uh, so we'll be doing that later. Kate, first of all. This is interesting, Kate. Right, you're my age, which is good. <laughs> Depending on which way you look at it. You're my age. And you say that you have to be careful what you say to younger people these days. Now, I've read the email several times, Kate, and I know exactly what you mean. Uh, examples she gives is uh, her, her granddaughter. If you mention perhaps immigration to her granddaughter, uh, whether it's legal or illegal. The granddaughter's got these firm, staunch ideas and she won't be swayed. Oh, no, 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 no. I think this and I think that. Kate says in her email that 
she has to think before she says anything to her granddaughter because she'll kick her off, she'll upset her and she'll go off on a rant. And she said it's the same she's noticed with a lot of younger people. And she says, is it because we've got social media now? I think so, Kate. I know what you mean. You've got to be careful what you say. Uh, she's got another friend. I'm not going to go into this, but the Israeli-Palestinian thing. This other friend, Kate says that she just daren't even mention it because this friend of hers, she'll take off. Rah, 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 I think this, I think that. Rah, 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 rah. And she says she's got to be so careful. She's got various friends that she has to... What's that? Uh, this isn't your... Uh, words, Kate. Walk on egg eggshells, isn't it? Tread on eggshells. You've got to be so careful. I know what you mean. I know one or two people like that. You have to be careful what you, what you say because they'll they'll go off into a rant, not a raised rant. But uh, yes, you're right, Kate. It it wasn't like that in our day. You could say things. I mean, back in the old days, I remember my teens, my twenties, even my thirties. No one went on and ranted about politics the way they do. Now, not us younger people, anyway. In my teens, I don't think I or anyone I knew talked about politics. One chap might chip in one evening and say, oh, do you vote Labour or Conservative? And, you know, no one answered him. No one was interested in our teens. You know, we're in the pub. We're having a good time. Whereas these days, I don't know, they do, they do seem to be to use Kate's word, uh, very opinionated, a lot of the youngsters. That, that could be a good thing, get involved in it all, or, or I don't know. But uh, I do know what you mean, Kate. There goes our clock. Can you hear the grandmother clock in the hall chiming away? Yes, I do know what you mean. You have to be careful what you say to certain people because they'll either be upset or they'll start ranting. Anyway, thanks for your email, Kate. <laughs> Just uh, think before you speak. That's the thing. Oh, I know one person. I know one chap, nothing to do with that, but uh, he doesn't think before he opens his mouth. He'll come out with comments and you think, oh, no, 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 don't say that in front of people. He just doesn't think. Just going back to social media, that's where people, all these views are aired, isn't it? And all these bandwagons, as they call people, jump on this bandwagon or that bandwagon. And of course, it, it all becomes a big thing. In the old days, for example, the only news we had, the only reason we knew, say something had kicked off in, I don't know, in Paris, something kicked off or Berlin or wherever. Well, we only heard that on the radio news, the TV news or a newspaper. And the newspaper, it wouldn't be in that day's paper if it just happened, whereas now it's live. And people all come up on social media with their comments. I think this, I think that. And there's arguments and rows going on, on on Twitter or X or whatever it's called and various other platforms. People all slagging each other off. And we didn't have any of that. Perhaps that's why we've got more people now that are younger people that are heavily into it all with their opinions and things. I don't know. Anyway, let's move on. Practical jokes. Now, let me find the first email. Susan, you say you work in an office and you've got a, well, you call her a practical joker, but you also say she's more of a, a disrupting influence. And uh, yes, I can't, I can't comment on that, uh, what you've put there. What this lady does, you finish at five, what she'll do at four o'clock if she needs to get away early. She'll do something to the computer system. She's quite into computers. She'll get into the system and do something to it. So none of the computers work in your office. You've got, what is it, 12 people in there, each sitting at their own computer. These 12 people are all working away on their computers and suddenly, four o'clock, the whole lot crash. You know, all the computers crash and go off. So that's it. Everyone goes home early because there's nothing they can do. This is the trouble, isn't it, with computers, online stuff. If it doesn't work, well, that's it. You can't get on with your work. And she says there's nothing else we can do in the office. It is all keyboard-based, as you've put it. Susan, and what can you do? So the boss says, oh, OK, I'll have to get uh, IT in. You might as well all clear off home. Um, I don't know about the phone. Don't you have to answer the phone? I don't know what office it is you work in, Susan, so I don't know. But uh, the, she doesn't do this every day, obviously, this woman. But every now and then, perhaps once a month, if she needs to get away early. And no one is supposed to know it's her. But everyone knows it is her because no one else has got the, the knowledge to do it, to crash the system. 
So they all know it's her, but there's no sort of proof, if you like. I'd, yeah, that's not really a practical joke, is it? That's sabotage, I'd call it. Sabotage. <laughs> Barry, nice to hear from you. You say that uh, back in the 70s, what you used to do, one of you would nip round the phone box and call the office, call the boss there, and make some complaint or other, not about any particular person, but about the company, rant and rave on the phone, and then, <laughs> then the boss would come out of his office in a terrible mood. Apparently he was a horrible boss. And he'd come out of the office and he'd say, I'll be back later, and he'd clear off for the morning or the afternoon. He'd clear off. So that was their way of getting rid of him. Go round a phone box, rant and rave, rrr, 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 I think this, I think that, you're a terrible company, I'm going to go to your HQ, and you know, your main office, and tell them about you. <laughs> and he'd get in such a strop that he'd clear off. That's good. Yeah, that's one way to get rid of a horrible boss, isn't it? Give you a few hours' peace. Just before I forget, hello, Ray, if you're listening. Nice to hear from you again. Neighbour of yours had a house, uh, an old boy. Uh, it's a while since I've read the email, so I can't remember all of it, Ray, but I'm going to come on to something else in a minute. And the old boy in his house said to people like neighbours and friends, oh, I'm getting on a bit. Could you help out? Could you mow the lawn? And someone would say, oh, yeah, yeah, of course I'll mow the lawn. But, oh, could you just do that? I wonder whether you could just... I need a bit of painting done in, in my house. Yeah, I'll do that for you. And it went on like this. Now, this, Ray, reminds me of a programme I saw. Was it Midsummer Murders, I believe? Old boy in his house. And a woman who lived next door or wherever, he said, oh, I'll have a few people round for dinner. You know, I wonder whether you could do the cooking and do a bit of sort of like waitressing for me. And she said, oh, well, I don't know. I mean, I've got my own family. And then he'd take her to one side and say, look, I haven't got long left, as you know. And uh, this place, well, between you and me, when I go, it's all yours. I'm leaving the whole lot to you. And she'd say, oh, oh, well, in that case, of course I'll cook the meal. Yes, yeah, I'll, I'll do some waitressing when your friends come round, keep them topped up with drinks. <laughs> and another chap in the village, he said, uh, oh, could you do my garden? It needs a bit of landscaping. And this chap said, well, look, you know, it's going to cost you a bit. Oh, yeah, well, I haven't got any money. It's all tied up in the property. I'll tell you what I'll do, look. You've done a lot for me. You landscape my garden, and when I go, I haven't got long. All this is yours. The house is yours. I'll put it in the will. And this chap was sort of, oh, OK. Can I see the will? Anyway, he did the will, and it was all left to this chap. He saw the will. Oh, oh, right, OK. That's nice. And he landscaped the entire garden. I think the woman saw the will as well. Then he changed it, of course. And then someone else came along. Oh, if you do this and that for me, I tell you what, all this is yours. I'll show you the will. I'll change my will. Anyway, <laughs> when he went, I think, I don't know what the last will was that he'd written, but all the wills had been, you know, they were cancelled because there's a new one. No one got a penny. They didn't, none of them got a penny. <laughs> and this old boy tricked them all along. What a fantastic idea. But in the, it was Midsummer Murders, I'm sure. And it was fantastic watching these people. Oh, well, if you're leaving the entire property to me, uh, yeah, I'll landscape your garden for you. It's going to take quite a few weeks, but a lot of hard work, but I'll do it for you. And, of course, they spent money as well. The woman with the food doing the meals, she bought the food and she bought the wine. The landscape gardener, he bought all the plants and stuff. <laughs> and the old boy died and none of them got a penny out of it i think that's fantastic so thanks for that ray yes a similar thing to your neighbor it's it's crafty isn't it but it's I, it's quite good actually in a way i'm not going to do that though we've got too many kids and grandkids and oh dear when we go they'll uh they'll all get that <laughs> happy days yes in ray's case in your case ray wasn't the property rented now, I knew a chap like that. He was in a rented property, told everyone it was his. And he actually said to a friend of his that, I'll leave you this, you know, when I go. I've only got a few years. I'll leave you the bungalow. And this friend believed it. And he did all sorts of work for him. He didn't spend money on the place because he wasn't that fit himself. He had health problems. But uh, the chap with the bungalow, the rented bungalow, was always saying, oh, could you give me a lift here? Could you give me a lift there? And I wonder if you could do a bit of shopping for me. And 
it ended up that the place was rented, you know, just like uh, your one, Ray. It's amazing, honestly, the cheek of some people. I don't think I'd have the, the nerve to do that. Because when, they, when they've gone, people are swearing and cursing and oh, I did all that work on his garden. I landscaped it and, uh, oh dear, it's not very nice really, but in a way it's quite funny. <laughs> a friend of mine in his 80s had trouble with a bank. They stopped his credit card and uh, I forget the reason, but they stopped the credit card and then they wanted him to prove his identity. He was trying to buy something, I think, from a shop, a few hundred pounds worth. And the shop said to him, well, look, your car's been stopped. You have to go to your bank. He went to the bank, had to go through all the rigmarole of identifying himself with a photo and all this stuff. Then he had to go back to the shop. And he said, right, now that's sorted out. And the shop, I had to, there was a problem with that. I don't know. I don't know. It went on and on. And he said to me, in the old days, he's in his 80s, he said in the old days, you just go into a shop with cash or a cheque, and later on with cheques, he had a card number on the back, didn't you? So the bank would honour it. He said, now it's just an absolute nightmare. He spent the entire, well, he said from lunchtime onwards, the entire afternoon, going backwards and forwards between the shop, the bank, the shop, the bank, making phone calls. And in the, <laughs> in the end, he bought the item he wanted. But isn't that a nightmare? Now, the reason I mentioned all that, my mother wants a hundred pounds in 10 pound notes. Simples, you'd think, you go to the bank, could have a hundred quid in 10 pound notes. No, nope. you have to use a cash machine outside. Yeah, but that will issue twenties and tens. I want all tens. I want a hundred quid in 10 pound notes because she wants to put them in Christmas cards, you know, to the grandchildren. The bank person said, well, you know, we can't guarantee it'll give you £10 notes. You'll have to go to the post office. So Trish is thinking, well, I'm in a bank. Why? Anyway, she went to the post office. Can I have 100 quid in £10 notes? The bank won't do it. And he said, oh, blah, 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 name of the bank. And she said, yes. He said, yeah, that's typical. He said, they won't give change out anymore. In the old days, when you're in a shop, you know, you want change for your till, you nip down to the bank could I have a fiver's worth of 50 pences and two quid's worth of whatever? And they do that for you. And little, little bags, you know, they do that for you. They won't now. Well, this certain bank, particular bank, wouldn't do it. What is going on? Banks are closing down. I think we've had another one or two locally closed down. They've gone. They're now flats or whatever with people living in them. Because if they found a stash of cash, wouldn't it, under the floor somewhere, <laughs> they move into their flat and take the floorboards up for whatever reason, and there's a, a few grand under there in used notes. <laughs> but what is going on? Post offices are closing. Off licenses, as I said earlier, they've gone. I mean, they're important, off licenses. You know, these are vital to our very existence. Off licenses and <laughs> cigarette machines out on the street. No, not cigarette machines. But what's going on? You can't go into your bank and get money. Well, you can, but not the the money, you know, was it denomination or whatever they call it that you want. And also, I don't think you can take, in the old days, at the end of the day, you've got your takings in your shop, or you know, what, twice a week or whenever, you go to the bank with a load of change. You know, you've got like 20 quid's worth of 2p bits and you know, whatever they call these days, 10p bits. I don't see any money. So I don't know what they're called. I'm not allowed to have money. You go in there. I got you know, like 20 quid's worth of 10 p's. Oh, no, we don't want that. We can't accept all that nonsense. No. <laughs> it's supposed to be a bank. Stone the crows. Banks, post offices, sweet shops have gone. Off licenses have gone. Pubs are disappearing. What's going to be left? Some idiot the other day was talking on this telly. Idiot person saying about reviving the high street again. We're going to put it back like the old days. We're going to have a greengrocer. We're going to have a butcher's. And a people, on the other people on the panel are looking at her thinking, you know, what? What, do you want, what do you want about? Who's going to own these shops? Who's going to do that? Who's going to spend money opening a shop when everyone's gone up the supermarket? One of the chaps uh, more or less said that. He said, it's not going to work, is it? You know, people won't go there. Oh, no, no, she said, it will. It'll work. It'll work well. People will start going back into town, into the high street. It won't work. I mean, everyone knows it won't work. But anyway, she's going to have a go. I don't know who she is, some government person or something. 
<laughs> some idiot. <laughs> Happy days. I don't know. What has gone wrong with everything? I had to go out the front. You remember I was talking the other day about cleaning the drains. They get blocked up with leaves. Well, we had a huge puddle out the front the other day where our drain is. I had to go out there with a, a broom thing and get the leaves out of the way because there was a lake forming in the road. And I'm looking out of my window here from my high-tech air-conditioned studio thinking, that water is, is getting it's bigger and bigger, that lake. And I knew where the drain was, so I had to go out there, put some wellies on, go out there and clear the drain. Councils don't bother to do it anymore. Dreadful state of affairs. Oh, email from Brian. Do you remember I was talking about phone boxes ringing, you know, when I was younger, when I was a kid, early teens, walk past one of the red phone boxes and the phone's ringing. So you go in there and answer it. Brian said that uh, he used to have a phone box at the end of his road, which most of us did. And, you know, now and then he'd be down there and the phone would be ringing. And it was usually, as I said, well, can you go over to number 63, just over the road? Tell Mrs Jones, you know, it's her cousin on the phone, which he would do, we are fair enough. And he said a couple of times, though, there's some idiot on the phone. Some I would, I don't know who it was. He doesn't know who it was. I've had a similar thing, Brian. He said he'd answer the phone. And he'd say, hello, who's that? What do you want? And someone would say, oh, can you tell me what year it is? <laughs> he'd say, what are you talking about? And slam the phone down. And he reckoned the same as I did. He reckoned it was someone locally looking out of their window, right, spying through the net curtains, ringing the phone box, waiting for someone to answer, and then saying stupid things. Now, that's similar to, uh, who was it? Keith. Hello, Keith. Keith says that he reckons that there were people who used to spy out of their windows. You'd think they'd get a life, wouldn't you? Keith said that he'd go in the phone box and he'd have perhaps, a, I don't know, a blue overcoat in, you know, in the winter, navy blue or, and whatever, a hat, a bobble hat. And he said someone would say on the phone, oh, I don't like your hat. I don't like that overcoat you're wearing. He said, so they knew they were looking at him and he'd look round at all the houses, all the windows. I mean, you don't know where it's coming from, do you? Thanks for that, Keith. Yeah, that, that's... <laughs> of course, we don't have the phone boxes anymore. I was walking past one once on the way home from school and it was ringing, so I answered it. And the woman said, have you just pressed the button for 999? Do you remember they used to have a button, a white button? It said, press for 999, you lift the receiver and then press that. And it would call 999, so you don't have to worry about dialing it. And I said to the operator, press what button? She said, the 999 button, you shouldn't press that. I said, I'm just walking past the box and the phone's ringing. And she said, well, you must have pressed the button. I don't believe you. Oh, dear. Anyway, I told her where to go. <laughs> I told her where to go to slam the phone down. Do you remember those buttons? Do you remember the ashtrays? Well, it wasn't an ashtray as such. It was a little semicircular thing where you could lay your cigarette while you're doing the dialing and putting in your pennies. I remember once I lifted up the phone and I said the number I wanted. She said, you put four pennies in the box. So I thought I'd trick her. So I just pressed uh, whichever button it was four times, clonk, 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 clonk. I said, yeah, I've done that. She said, it hasn't registered. Have you put your money in? She obviously heard the clonking because I put the phone near where the button was. And I said, well, I've just put the four pennies in. Oh, well, it hasn't registered. It must have a fault. OK, I'll put you through. <laughs> so I got through. I phoned my grandmother uh, in the next town. That was funny. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm just seeing if I can make a free phone call. Luckily, the operator wasn't listening. Of course, back then, a lot of people didn't have a phone at home. So the phone box outside or just down the road, you know, that was their phone. And you get uh, perhaps, I don't know, a dozen or more people in the street. That was their phone. And what some of them would do, which was a better idea, really, uh, a friend of theirs or a relation would ring the box at, say, 7.30 this evening, I'll phone you at the box. And you'd find there's two or three people hanging around outside a phone box at whatever time because they've got calls coming in, probably all around the same time. And, of course, the phone's ringing. And I remember women scrambling to get to the box. That's for me, that's for me. No, it's not, that's for me. <laughs> it was hilarious. Honestly, it was really funny. But I like the practical jokes, So people phoning the box and saying, well, I don't like that hat you're wearing. Where'd you get that? You look awful. I think that's brilliant. I should have thought of that in the old days. I would have done that. No, I wouldn't. I, would I? 
Stone the crows. I was an upright pillar of the community. <laughs> Not. <laughs> I was in a phone box once. There was this girl that worked in the pub and the pub had closed. It's sort of half eleven at night. Um, I'm walking home with her because because it was on my way. She lived on my way home sort of thing. And it started lashing with rain. So we dashed into the phone box. It was showery type weather. I don't know when it was, April or something. Dashed into the phone box. And this cop car pulled up. Oh, this cop got out. It's pouring with rain. He said, what are you two up to? And we said, well, sheltering from the rain. You know, what do you think? He said, well, are you sure you're not up to anything? You can't do that in a public phone box. And this girl was embarrassed. She said, do what? <laughs> She had a right go at him. What do you think I am? Went off at him. Of course, I'm sniggering. So he thought I was guilty. I thought it was funny. Because he, anyway, there we are. That's uh, that's another little snippet from the past. They were great days. I suppose the cops saw us both in a phone box because they had a light in them, didn't they? A little bulb at the top. If it hadn't been nicked, because people used to nick them. I don't know what they did with them. I suppose they used them at home, say it's going out and buying a bulb. <laughs> You'd see a lot of phone boxes at night that were dark. But they'd have a man go round and check them and clean the phone and all that business. We had a phone. Um, I forget, what was I, about 12 years old when we got our phone? About 12. And the woman next door, this old woman, I nearly called her something else, so this elderly lady, I mustn't say that, she knew that we had a phone. She heard about it. And... She said, oh, can my uh, friend, whoever it was, in Wales or somewhere, phone? It wouldn't cost us, of course. You know, can, I, can I get her to phone me sort of once a week? So my dad said, yeah, OK. He should have said, no, you know, off, go away. Not off. <laughs> Clear off. That's what I was looking for. Anyway, he said, yeah, OK, yeah. So once a week we get this phone call. Hello? Hello? Who's that? And we said, what do, we, what do you mean, who's that? It's us. Is that you? Do you want that woman next door? Oh, can you go and get her? Oh, you should have heard it. They're on the phone for hours. Well, it seemed like hours. This old woman would come in from next door. We'd sit her in the hall, because the phones are in the hall. Sit her in the hall of the phone. And honestly, you should have... Oh, oh how, how are you doing, dear? I'm all right. How are you? Oh, my back hurts. And they've been going on like this for ages. And yeah, my parents got fed up with it. In the end, they, <laughs> they didn't answer the phone whenever this woman phoned, you know, once a week, they didn't answer the phone. Because the people next door had a load of money. They had more money than us. They wouldn't get their own phone, they use ours. So anyway, my father said, sorry, our phone's out of action. This is our problems. That's why, because she said, oh, you, you haven't answered the phone. I think the woman wrote to her and said, uh, they don't answer the phone anymore next door. So, you know, he lied and said that it's out of order. But uh, <laughs> should have sent me next door. I'd have told her what for. No, I couldn't do that. I was only 12. The old boy next door, I think they were brother and sister. The old boy had a, a car. Was it a Wolseley? Wolseley 1500 or something. And he loved it. He was always polishing it and mucking about with it. He knew this young chap and he used to lend his car to this chap. Now, I'm not quite sure what it was all about. Anyway, this chap would borrow his car. You know, he's in his 20s, this, this lad. He'd borrow the old boy's car and go off out for the evening, bring it back the next day. And I was out in the drive one morning and he, the old boy had got his car back and he was just having a look round it. And inside he found a load of chips. You know, what do you, you oh, they're French fries. What did you call them in America? Crisps in America. Yeah, we call crisps. Oh, it's confusing. You know what I mean. <laughs> what crisps are in a packet. They're sort of crispy bits of potato with salt on and they taste of cheese and vinegar or whatever. Chips come from the fish and chip shop, don't they? Like French fries. Anyway, he found these French fries all over the floor in the back of the car. And he's saying to me, oh, look at that, there's chips. I knew what had happened. This lad had got out with his mates or whatever. And it was always happening. When it, whenever the car came back, the next morning, the old boy, he was always praising this lad. I don't know why. But uh, he was saying, oh, he's a lovely chap. I like to lend him my car if I can. This chap just went racing around in the car with his mates and mucking about. It came back dead did. One morning he looked at it. He said, oh, there's a dent there. And I said, oh, I, I expect you know, he hit something. Oh, he wouldn't have done that. No, he wouldn't have done that. Must have happened some other time. Silly old boy. And then what made me laugh one morning. Now, this is funny. One morning he's in the back of the car taking out chips, an old chip 
wrappers, you know, papers and stuff. And he pulled out this, what looked like a bit of cloth. And he said, oh, he must have been cleaning the windows or something. And it's a pair of knickers <laughs> on the floor in the back of the car. Of course, I'm just laughing my head off, trying not to let him see. I'm sniggering. And he had this screw, you know, screwed up in his hand. And uh, he said, oh, can you put that in the bin? It's obviously where he's been cleaning the windows. And he threw this, <laughs> his knickers at me. <laughs> I caught them. I put them in the bin. Then when I washed my hands. But he was so gullible, so naive. I didn't like that young chap that used to come round. I reckon he took money from him as well. He sort of played on the old boy's generosity. But uh, when he found that, oh dear. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> One practical joke, this idiot friend of mine, Dave his name was, we were at uh, technical college, you know, doing electronics and all that stuff. And he had this carrier bag with a telephone in it. I'm not sure what he was doing with it. I don't know where he got it from, but a proper telephone. It was a red telephone, quite nice. And he had it in this carrier bag. And lunchtime at Tech, you know, we went down the town. I think he wanted to do a bit of shopping or whatever. We were, what were we, 18, 19? And... He took this phone out of this bag, this carrier bag, and put the receiver to his ear and he's saying, yeah, hello, hello. Oh, OK, hang on a minute. As this lady was passing, this old lady, and he said, excuse me, a telephone call for you. And she said, oh, thank you very much. She took the receiver and she said, hello, hello, this is whatever her name was. This is Amy, hello. And I mean, she, it was awful. It was funny, but the poor old lady, she thought, she thought it was a phone call for her he didn't even know her and he tried it with some bloke there's this bloke walking past and he said oh excuse me there's a phone call for you and this bloke nearly hit him he said what are you talking about you swore at him and he went he raised his fist to hit him i was standing back a bit and this dave ran off <laughs> and the chap looked at me and i just played innocent i'm just looking in a shop window i don't know who that bloke was with the phone but he was an idiot he was always playing you know, practical jokes on people. We were out in the van once. You know, we were TV engineers. This was after tech. And uh, we're out in the van. And this cop stopped us. He was driving. This cop has stopped us. And he said, you took that round about uh, rather fast. And uh, this Dave, he said, oh, no, I didn't. And he looked at this cop. He said, don't I know you? And I thought, don't start cheeking him like that. And this cop said, oh, I doubt it. And Dave said, I'm sure I know you from somewhere. Yeah, what's your name? Where do you live? And this cop wasn't amused. And I'm just cringing, thinking, shut up, Dave, shut up. Anyway, eventually the cop let us go. But uh, I said to Dave, you idiot, yeah, you're asking for trouble. You wind him up. He's going to book you for something. Oh, no, he's all right. <laughs> Dear. That was the Dave that used to go, he reckoned, take a roundabout at 60 miles an hour in an old Ford Anglia van. That's what the van was. Oh, I know why we got stopped another time. Different copper, fortunately. The tax disc was on a little bracket in front, of, you know, just by the windscreen. And he had put all our job sheets in front of the, you know, between the tax disc and the window, the windscreen. So you couldn't see the tax disc. So this copper stopped us and he gave him a load of cheek. The cop, oh dear. Anyway, I moved the, the papers. I just, oh, sorry, I put those there and moved them. I was in the passenger seat. And the cop, you know, just let us go on our way. But he started being cheeky to him. He'd come into the workshop and he'd say, I've just taken that roundabout, 60 miles an hour. And we'd look at him, yeah, OK, David. Oh, I did, I did two wheels. And he just, I was going to say, I think I've told you this before, wasn't exaggerating, it was just downright lies. You cannot take a roundabout in a Ford Anglia van at 60 miles an hour. You roll it over. In fact, he did roll a car over, what, his old car. He had a Ford console and it was on the ice and he skidded on the ice. I wasn't in the car, luckily. He skidded on the ice. It hit the curb and rolled over. <laughs> that was the end of that car. It was all dented and smashed in. I don't know, practical jokes. It's all good fun, isn't it? It's, it was innocent fun. These days, you don't do things. You get arrested. You know, if you try to have any fun with anyone, they take offence and go and tell the cops, then you get arrested. <laughs> Susan, lovely to hear from you. Just got your email. Where are we now? Saturday. Um, what's the time? Mid-morning somewhere. I think the clock stopped. <laughs> yes, it stopped. Oh, well, not to worry. Two degrees this morning. 
No, minus two degrees this morning. What am I saying? Minus two and a frost. The first proper frost. Now, Gary the tortoise is in his home in the shed. He's got all the heat lamps and the UV stuff and all that. But he really is getting close to hibernating now. Susan, you asked what we feed him. Well, during the summer, we feed him weeds, plantain, uh, dandelion leaves. There's, If you go online, you can look up various places, just look up tortoise food. What we don't feed him, in the old days, people did this. Tomatoes, lettuce leaves, all sorts of leftovers from the salad. And it's not good for them at all. We give him a little bit of a grape, half a grape. Uh, he likes grapes sometimes. Perhaps a quarter of a tomato as a treat, but no seeds. You must take out the seeds. The best thing, Susan, is to look up online and see exactly what's what. He loves cucumber as well, but only a little bit as a treat. As I say, in the old days, people, I remember, neighbours and ourselves, chucking all the salad stuff on the lawn, cucumber, tomato, everything. And our tortoises, we had two. They'd munch away, they loved it, but... It's not good for them. And they, they died young, our two tortoises. I don't know how old they were. Uh, well, when I say young, they were probably about 20 years old, 15 years old, maybe. And they both died. And it's because of the dreadful diet they were on. A lot of people around us had tortoises. They all did the same, chuck salad stuff out onto the lawn, and they'd all munch away and not live very long. What we do with Gary in the summer, we let him out in the garden... And he goes round chewing up the weeds and whatever he can find. He eats grass, anything natural. We do use the calcium dust as well, as you said you do. So you have a look online. There are lots of tortoise places. Basically anything natural. But there are things that are poisonous. So don't, uh, don't give him anything like that. Have a look online. Now Susan's always put here, when I was a girl, that's it. When I was a boy, when I was a girl, I used to go to the woods near my home with friends. We'd run around, ride our bikes, make dens, and then run home when we heard the call for tea time. Kids can't do that now because most don't have any woods or a park locally. Well, that's true. It seems the kids aren't safe doing those things these days. It is a shame, isn't it? And driving, Susan, you mentioned driving. Oh, don't mention driving, struth. Have to have our wits about us from the minute we leave home until we arrive where we're going to avoid an incident. I know, I've just driven back from my mum's. Only, what, three, four miles? Nightmare. People pulling out in front of you. People indicating left where they're going right. <laughs> it's just an absolute nightmare. As I said in my email, Susan, I'll be glad when I get too old to drive anymore. I used to love it. Back in the early days, I loved driving. It was fantastic. But now, I don't know. I don't know. It's all just gone wrong, hasn't it? I woke up at three o'clock this morning. Goodness knows why. Three o'clock, couldn't go back to sleep, looking at the iPad, looking out of the window, shining my torch out of the bedroom window at the frost <laughs> to see what's going on. Then I put the television on. We've got telly in our room. But we don't often use it, but uh, we've got one anyway. It doesn't wake Trish up because she sleeps through anything. I was watching TV. Well, that was about four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I don't know why. It's Perhaps it's old age. I remember when I was 18, when I was a boy, I used to go out clubbing and drinking and a curry at midnight, <laughs> sleep perfectly, up at uh, 8 o'clock, well, off to work at 8 o'clock the next morning, bright as a button, as they used to say. My mother wants some more conkers because she puts them round the house to keep the spiders away. I don't know whether it works. She seems to think it does. Well, there are no more conkers now. The conker season is over. Unfortunately, it's over. She was telling me about the war again, and well, they used to get conkers in the war and stuff, and about this incendiary bomb that dropped. And I said to her, that's the one I think I've told you before, dropped her, her sister was coming back from school or wherever, and this incendiary bomb dropped and didn't go off. It just splattered everything, including my mum's sister, my auntie, with oil everywhere, covered in oil, the houses, everything. Luckily, it didn't go off. And I said to her, look, can I record this? Oh, no, I can't do that. I can't have you recording me. She said, I'll be nervous. I can't take the little recorder around there because she'll know. You know, she's not daft. She'll say, what's that? What are you doing? What's that there? So it's very, it's very difficult. I must try and get some stories from her, though. I said people will be interested to hear what it was like for you, you know, during the war years. But 
I don't know, she won't do it. I'll have to dream up some method. Perhaps the next time she's round here, I could wire up the dining room with those hidden microphones. <laughs> but I'm interested. I like hearing about the war years and when she was a child. It is interesting. Do you remember the term latch key kid? A friend of mine I was talking to the other day, we were talking about the school days decades ago, and he said, oh, I was a latch key kid. My mum and dad were both out at work all the time. Now that's interesting because that's the 50s and for both parents to be out at work all the time in the 50s that was quite unusual. The term latchkey kids I think came in more in the 60s and 70s when women started to go out to work full time rather than little part time jobs and he said it was horrible. He'd get home, there'd be a key hidden somewhere in the garden, he knew where the key was obviously, let himself into the house silence no one there is in the winter cold because the fire wasn't going i mean there's no one there to keep the coal fire going all day so it's cold he made up the fire got that going his parents didn't get home till six and what he would do his mum would leave him a sandwich and a drink in the in the kitchen they get home at six then obviously they've got to have the, the meal and all that and he hated it because i was saying when i got in from school about four o'clock my mum would be there and there'd be a, a jam sandwich on the table for me because that's my favourite jam sandwich. Glass of orange juice or Corona, cherry aid, or the orange flavour one. I used to like the Corona lorry coming round. So I got home and there's things happening, you know. My mum's there, she's got the radio on and in the winter the house was warm. It must have been awful for the, the so-called latchkey kids. Of course, nowadays... Most mums are out to work, aren't they? They go out to work, don't get back till, I don't know, whatever time, five o'clock, six o'clock. But of course, flexi time helps that a lot. If you're allowed to do that at work, a lot of companies are stopping flexi time now. So yes, it was really interesting chatting to this friend of mine. And I said to him, would you like to have a chat to me, you know, on the microphone? Oh, no, no, I'm not doing that. Why is it no? <laughs> Why doesn't anyone want to have a chat when there's a microphone listening? The only way to do it really is, as I said, to hide the microphone. Because this chap was talking about his school days. And I just thought that everyone would like to hear that. But apparently we're not going to. He won't do it. Just had a message from my North Carolina son. Just landed at Heathrow Airport. So that's good. I think he's here for a week. So <laughs> that'd be nice. Look forward to seeing him having a chat. I wanted him, who was it suggested that he makes up a, a, a recording about life in America, living in America as an Englishman, because he, he's been there seven years now. Doesn't time fly? Seven years ago he moved there, but he hasn't got time. I think that's another thing. People don't have time to do anything these days. Oh, before I forget, someone suggested I go downtown with my recorder, go up to people and say, hi, I'm doing a podcast episode. Have you lived in Worthing long? Do you live in Worthing? What do you think of Worthing and all this stuff? And I, I thought, well, I can't do that. I'll probably get someone punch me in the face. What's it got to do with you? Clear off. <laughs> Be different if I had a perhaps a BBC badge or Sky News or GB News thing on the microphone or something and a cameraman. But just me on my own with a little recorder. Anyway, I went out into our street and I walked down the road. I just go to the local shop. I took the recorder with me. And halfway down our street, there was a chap coming back. I thought I knew him. I thought he was a neighbour from somewhere up the road. He has said hello before. So I got the recorder out and I said, oh, glad I bumped into you. I've got the recorder going. And I said, just making up a podcast. What do you think about uh, Worthing? Have you lived here long? And he looked at me and he said, it wasn't the chap I thought it was. He said, What's it got to do with you? I walked, walked off. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's it. That sums it up, really. I'm not going down the town talking to people. I thought he was the chap that lived at the end of the road somewhere and always said hello. But obviously it wasn't him. Anyway, he was rude. I did record it. I was going to play it, but then I thought, well, no, if he hears it, he might sue me or something. <laughs> but uh, what a miserable devil. Why are some people so miserable? I was thinking about that the other day. Certain people, well, a lot of people, they are so miserable. I know there's the, the cost of living crisis and all this stuff going on and there's a lot of bad news around, but 
so many people seem to be miserable. I think you have to try and be positive. Look on the, the bright, what's that song? Look on the bright side of life. <laughs> I know there aren't many bright sides of life these days, but look at, uh, look at the sky now. Sunshine, I know it's cold out, there's nine degrees. Sunshine, blue sky, lovely. No leaves on the cherry tree, but lovely. We got Christmas coming. A lot of people seem to hate that these days. Oh, that reminds me. You know, this Black Friday thing where the shops sell things for kind of nothing and everyone queues up. They camp out overnight outside shops. John Lewis is it in London and the big shops, they camp out overnight to get there first. They were saying on the television, hardly any response to it. No one camped out. A few people milling around when the shops opened for the Black Friday thing. I don't know why they call it Black Friday. Sounds depressing, doesn't it? Hardly anyone turned up. It's, uh, it is depressing. It's, I don't know why everyone's so miserable. I think in the 50s after the war, I mean, I don't remember the war. I wasn't there. But in the 50s when I was a child, I do remember people being more positive. I suppose they'd had the war years. There was still rationing when I was born. When did that end? I was born in 51. I think rationing went on to 53, was it? 54? But people were positive. People were jolly jovial there's a word after all the depressing war years at last it's over and they can look forward to the future i suppose that's why they were more jolly then and more positive about everything whereas these days I mean, all we get is bad news isn't it price of petrol has gone up gas has gone up electricity bill has gone up they've got to tax this tax that that's gone up this has gone up uh, my pension's gone up how about that my old age pension i'm going to get another what is it 900 pounds a year or something but then they put other taxes up so in one hand and out of the other <laughs> so i suppose that's nothing to be happy about is it really so we must all try and be a little bit more positive i think try and smile a little bit more don't often see people smiling in fact my mum this morning she said oh i love saturdays when you and trish come round because you always make me laugh it's nice to be able to cheer someone up, isn't it? You know how people, some people you meet and you have a chat for 10 minutes and you go away depressed, feeling them down. Ooh, well, I wish I hadn't bumped into them. All they did was moan. Whereas someone else you bump into, they're all chatty and jolly and smiley. And when you walk away from them, you feel lifted. It's good, isn't it? It's a shame we can't all lift each other up a little bit. Anyway, enough of that. We're coming up to the hour. Raise rants at protonmail.com. Com. Not long now till... Can I mention the C word? Yes, why not? It's the 25th today, so it's a month, isn't it? Yeah, the C word. Not long till Christmas. We've already sorted out the bits and pieces up in the loft, the Christmas tree and the decorations and all the lights that probably won't work. <laughs> Do you know, it only seems a few months ago. We put everything up in the loft. Good, that's that over. We can look forward to the spring and the summer. Here we are again all down from the loft again, get the tree put up in the lounge. We always decorate the place properly because I know a lot of people of our age don't bother, they just have a little tree or something. But we have on Boxing Day the entire family round. And they range from what age? I don't know, about 18 months or whatever, two years old, up to 80 something. <laughs> so all the kids come round and you know the grandchildren and they like to see the tree and the lights and all the decorations. Right, look after yourselves and uh, don't do anything I wouldn't do. I shall see you on Wednesday with a midweek message. Bye-bye for now.